neurologist here at Mission Hospital. I'm the chief of the Department of Neurology. Um, I co-run the Mission Neuroscience Institute. Um, I am the head of the epilepsy department. There's only one of me, so I'm the head of them. But I do run the epilepsy monitoring unit. Uh, and I do help out as being the co-lead for the epilepsy focus group for all of Providence. Uh, and recently I've been given the title of adjunct associate clinical professor of neurology at USC. Um, so I wanted to spend a little time talking about uh, epilepsy, uh, how it's managed, and kind of the, the journey that most people go through when they are diagnosed with, with epilepsy, because I think it's really important to kind of shed some light on, on what, what it exactly entails, uh, because it can be pretty scary when it happens, uh, and that diagnosis is very challenging, and having uh, as much information about what you're going to go through is really, I think, really important. So just a brief overview of kind of what it's going to be. We're going to go over some very basic um, stats and figures, go over what a seizure is, what is epilepsy, what may be some of the common causes, uh, then really spend the majority of it over, uh, over the, the time that we have together with what is a seizure, how does it get treated, what is epilepsy, how does that get treated, and what the steps are if medication fails. So just briefly about me, this is me. Uh, I did my undergraduate at UCLA. I did my medical school in the Caribbean at uh, American University of the Caribbean in St. Martin. I did my residency in Virginia Commonwealth University. And then I finished up with my fellowship in epilepsy uh, at USC. So uh, very nice to be back in California. I'll tell you that much. This is just a little bit about me. This is my wife and two lovely children. Uh, I was born in LA, raised in Ventura County. My wife is uh, lifelong born and bred in Orange County. Um, I wanted to move back to LA. She wanted to live in Orange County. So we compromised and we now live in Orange County. Uh, I relocated back to Orange County once I came back from Virginia. And uh, even while at USC, I was commuting and staying local. So I am very much invested in the community and the, uh, the area intend on staying here for quite some time. So this is our lovely hospital, Mission Hospital. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Uh, I have been here since 2018. I've been very fortunate to have this role um, and very happy to work here. And it has been very good to me. And we have been working diligently to kind of continue to expand, not just neurology, but particularly epilepsy. And uh, I'll explain to you exactly why epilepsy has been such a focus for me. Despite, you know, even putting my passion for it aside, uh, the importance of it is really highlighted in, in just how many of our fellow Orange County natives are suffering with this disease. So just some, some numbers to throw at you guys. Um, it's actually the fourth most common neurologic disorder, um, you know, close to somewhere between six and eight people per thousand of them deal with it. There's millions of people worldwide, 3.4 million Americans suffer with it. Um, and that's, these are very large numbers. Uh, there's 48 new cases uh, per 100,000 per year for the uh, United States, but there's 1,500 new cases in Orange County a year. Um, in a lifetime, one in 10 people in the United States will have a seizure. Uh, which is a, a very large number, and it's actually quite surprising. People don't really understand how fairly uh, frequent people, even if they don't have epilepsy, can have a seizure. Uh, but of those 10% of Americans that suffer a seizure, only about 1 in 26 or 1 in 30 close to will actually develop epilepsy. And we'll talk about the distinction between those two uh, in a little bit here. And ultimately, uh, of those patients who do develop epilepsy, one in three of them will continue to have seizures despite medical treatment. So why is going over all of this information so important? Well, you know, uh, one of my uh, mentors at USC really opened my eyes to, to how to uh, frame the issue with epilepsy. And it really comes down to, you have to recognize and appreciate epilepsy for being a public health problem. Um, it's not just epilepsy or seizures in isolation. Uh, putting aside the, the sheer number of people who do deal with it, there's, 
there's so many other associated issues that are uh, that come with the diagnosis of epilepsy. Um, difficulties with learning, uh, work restrictions, work accommodations, uh, an overwhelming, I think over two thirds of patients who have epilepsy develop some sort of depression or anxiety. Um, the burden that it puts on you psychologically, emotionally, financially to doctor visits, medications, remembering to take medications. Um, it, is, it is very burdensome. And uh, that's just the, um, some of the, the more pragmatic approaches. You know, they've shown that people have higher divorce rates and people are less likely to have children or be in long-term committed relationships. And you know, turning over to the more sensitive things, uh, the stigma. Uh, people have been shown to have less ability to climb socioeconomic status, uh, climb the socioeconomic ladder, uh, difficulties with job promotion. And really something that we don't take into consideration all that much, but is really, really relevant, particularly given the diversity that we have in Southern California is the stigma that it comes, that comes with it in cultures. So uh, I'll give you two kind of anecdotal uh, examples. One is um, there was a study that was done in USC a couple of years before I finished uh, my, my training there, where they looked at uh, the indigent population that was being treated at county. Uh, the majority of them fell, uh, were heavily Hispanic, Central American mostly, uh, with an average literacy of somewhere in middle school. Uh, and they found that two thirds of those patients actually believed that epilepsy was contagious. Um, and that's just, that really speaks to just the lack of education there is out there and the stigma that comes with that lack of education. Um, moving to the other side of the world, my family is historically from Iran and I had a, uh, a, an attending of mine who was also Iranian and he was born and raised in Iran. And he remembered uh, actually seeing a patient in the street have a, have a seizure. And he remembers that uh, somebody had gone and, and gotten chalk and drawn an outline around that man where he had had the seizure because they actually believed that that was the devil that had possessed him. So uh, even though America is, is much more developed and there's educational, there's fewer educational gaps um, and there's a different culture, you know, we have to be considerate of, of just what kind of social stigma uh, and cultural stigmas are associated with this in other places and that may end up affecting patients here. So briefly, let's, let's touch on some definitions before we kind of dive into it. So a seizure is, in a simple terms, a transient occurrence of uh, symptoms due to abnormal, inappropriate, excessive activity of the brain, electrical firing of the brain in a, in a pattern. So that can be affecting the whole brain or part of the brain. It can be affecting awareness. It could be preserving awareness. Um, I think most people will have the misunderstanding that they think of the Hollywood version of epilepsy where the patient falls and foams. And that's not necessarily always the case. So the operational definition of epilepsy, uh, moving to the next step is, is having uh, two unprovoked seizures, and I'll get to the meaning of provoked and unprovoked, uh, separated by 24 hours, or having one unprovoked seizure with a higher likelihood of having a second based on risk factors. So if someone has an abnormal MRI or has a head injury or has a seizure at night, these are things that can maybe increase the likelihood that a patient will have a second. So what is a provoked seizure? What is an unprovoked seizure? A provoked seizure, very plain and simple, is some event happens and there's a subsequent effect of a seizure. So the cause is they get, uh, they have a stroke. They get into a car accident and hit their head. They have bleeding on their brain. They have an infection. That is a cause that results in the effect of a seizure. That's a provoked seizure. An unprovoked is a seizure occurring without any prior inciting events. So you do all the workup and nothing really shows up as far as what might be an explanation for, for them to have a seizure. That's really important in distinguishing that someone has epilepsy or that someone has just a seizure. 
So some other terms, refractory epilepsy, the term is, is diagnosed when a patient has two medications that are at maximum capacity that they're maximized and they're still having breakthrough seizures. So they're taking their medicine, they are on two medicines at maximum dose that they can tolerate or that they uh, that is recommended and they're still having seizures. Uh, the status epilepticus, this is a big one. This is really important. This is when a seizure lasts longer than five minutes or if the patient has multiple seizures without really returning back to baseline. These are really important definitions to know because if you do have a family member or a friend that has epilepsy, knowing when to escalate care to the hospital uh, is really important. And that, that status epilepticus is really the thing that we worry the most about. Refractory status of epilepticus and super refractory status epilepticus are really more for the hospital setting. And so I won't jump into them too much, but that's if the status epilepticus continues despite adequate treatment, you start getting into that territory. So uh, I really like this chart because it kind of shows you the various breakdowns of what are the possible causes of epilepsy and seizures, depending on the age category of the patient. So as you can see, between the ages of you know, being born and 14 years of age, the overwhelming majority are congenital. You have genetic causes, uh, you have um, various developmental issues, you know, they were born with various uh, syndromes, things of that nature. And to a lesser degree, traumas like uh, perinatal in stroke uh, or in infections. And tumor and degenerative are far less likely, but still there. And as you notice, as you head through the different generations, those numbers start dropping in certain categories and start rising in other categories to the point that by the time you get to the age of 65, the overwhelming majority of the cases are due to stroke. Uh, very close second is tumor and uh, dementia because dementia actually has an eight times greater likelihood of developing seizures as a result of the dementia than others who don't uh, have dementia. So someone has a seizure. The first unprovoked seizure with, you know, no likelihood of a second one, you just actually watch, you don't start everyone. If we started 10% of Americans on seizure medication, America would be a very different place. Um, and so we just simply don't do that. Uh, if they have an unprovoked seizure with a high likelihood of having a second, then we, uh, and the, the way that we determine that is if they have an abnormal MRI, an EEG, if there's a high, a strong family history, a genetic component, or they have it in the middle of their sleep, those are things that may help us start a medicine with just one medication, with just one seizure. Or if they meet the technical diagnosis of epilepsy with two or more unprovoked seizures, that's really when we start the medic, that's when we start the medication. So this graph is actually really fascinating. Uh, I, I very much enjoy this slide because it really shows you how there has been an absolute, and, and there's no better word other than absolute explosion of discovery and treatment options for this disease in the last 50 years. You know, um, from the early mid 1800s after the Civil War to basically World War I, there was really only one, maybe two drugs. And between uh, World War I and, you know, the 60s, there was only a handful. There was maybe three or four. But between 1960 and now, there is just an innumerable amount. And it's still going. Uh, they're working very diligently and very aggressively in finding new treatment options, path, uh, pathways, uh, receptor sites, working on uh, improving the current um, pharmacological structures of certain the drugs that they already have to help reduce side effects and help become more effective. And so it's a really exciting time to be an epileptologist because you're seeing such an improvement in treatment options and, and really the patients are, are benefiting from it. So I, I kind of want to stay away from getting too into the weeds of what each medication is, does, side effects and all that, because that's a far more complicated conversation. But Really, the, the first line choice is that you start a patient on a medication. Um, 
50% of patients who start on their first medication if selected properly, because you need a, a neurologist and epileptologist to really make sure the medication correlates with the disease type that you have. Is it a seizure coming from one spot? Is it a genetic type? Those do help you know, guide our, our decision making. So if you have an appropriately picked medication, it's maximized. 50% of patients will respond to that and completely under control. So what happens to the other 50%? Well, you start them on a second drug. And of that 50%, another that 50% of that 50% will respond to that drug. So two out of three patients essentially will respond to one or two drugs at maximum therapeutic dose. That leaves quite a few number of people who are just still suffering with seizures. And that's really when we fall into that diagnosis of refractory epilepsy. So what do those people do? What, what happens to them? We, we don't just abandon them and let them continue to suffer. That's really when things take a drastic turn and we start looking for what can we do to better treat this patient? What can we do to maximize it? So drug users, as you can see, that's, that's quite a number of people that uh, you know, 3.4 million Americans have epilepsy. That's roughly 1 million Americans who are still having seizures despite taking the right medicine despite being compliant with the medicine. So this is, a, this is a, something that, that is not affecting a very small population. This is, this is a very serious public health issue. So you fail the first two drugs, what do you do? Well, that's really kind of where the epilepsy monitoring unit comes in. Uh, the epilepsy monitoring unit is really geared towards finding out where and why you may be having seizures. Because if there can be a better understanding of where it's coming from, the options about how best to treat it are opened up or closed depending on that. We never jump to, see, to surgery because surgery is so invasive and it's so aggressive. Uh, and if you can do something with non-invasive measures, most people would prefer it and it is the standard of care. So we really reserve this for the patients who are refractory. There are other cases where someone would get referred to an, uh, to an epilepsy monitoring unit. If you're at the beginning of the uh, journey and you're not sure if they're having a seizure, if you're concerned they may be having fainting spells or uh, behavioral issues, if uh, you think that there may be another diagnosis, if you uh, want to see exactly where it's coming from, all of these things are really going to be targeted for the epilepsy monitoring unit because. What you do with the epilepsy monitoring unit, and I'll show you pictures of it later on, is you're going to be hooked up to a continuous EEG, and there's going to be video monitoring. And during that period of time, we take certain precautions. We reduce, we adjust, we uh, change medication. We deprive you. We, we sleep deprive our patients. We let them get only a couple of hours of sleep with the purpose and the, the goal in mind to target a seizure, you know, is so counterintuitive because we spend so much of our time trying to suppress and prevent seizures that it, it, it's somewhat odd that we are flipping it around and, and trying to, to trigger a seizure. But the whole purpose is to see where it's coming from to see what we, what we can do for it. So that's kind of where the epilepsy, the USC Epilepsy Care Consortium comes in. Um, because of my affiliation with USC uh, from fellowship, I've been fortunate enough to be given the opportunity to be a part of this bigger conglomeration of, of hospitals. As you can see, you know, they range almost every major epilepsy uh, center in Orange County and many of them in LA. Uh, and we go even as far up as uh, close to Fresno, Bakersfield, Santa Barbara, we get everybody involved. We all come together once a week. In fact, we had it this morning and we discuss complex epilepsy cases um, in the hopes of creating a sense of um, collaboration and cooperation amongst our departments and our teams. Uh, and because many of us are colleagues and so we like to uh, rely on our colleagues to give input and insight uh, it's one of those things that you, you see something for so long, you may, you may miss things that other fresh eyes may not see, that may, may see that you may not. So we, we gather weekly and present these cases. And so that allows us the opportunity of providing patients for, at least I know for our hospital, 
being in a community setting allows us the opportunity to give them close to close to home care uh, with a essentially academic background. Um, it allows us the opportunity to, to let them have, you know, epileptologists from Children's Hospital, from USC, um, from various other institutions to weigh in so that we can make sure that we are streamlining, maximizing, and doing the right thing by the patients uh, with a consensus. So it's not just one person making the decision. So we admit them to the EMU. We put the EEGs on their heads. We try to figure out where the seizure is coming from. Once we have an idea of what side and where exactly it's coming from, that case is put together uh, along any other information we may have, an EEG, an MRI, a PET scan, uh, a MEG. We present the history. We have, uh, depending on how far along the case they are, we, we have neuropsychological evaluations available as well to determine language, hemisphere dominance, uh, hippocampus predominance, um, and help to kind of try to get a full grasp of, of every component that's necessary for the decision making of a, of a surgical case. So once we have all that stuff put together, um, we go forward and we present it to the case, to the, uh, the epileptic care consortium. We, do, we show the EEG, we show the seizure, we show the MRI, and we go through all the pertinent uh, ancillary information and come up with a decision. So once that is discussed, we round table and discuss what, what we all think would be the uniform consensus of next, the next step. The next step is, is fairly, uh, to some extent broad, but um, it can be broken down into four categories, really phase two, which is a more invasive uh, procedure where we uh, take the patient to surgery and place either electrographic um, strips on top of the brain or depth electrodes where we, we put um, electrodes within the actual brain tissue to get a close, up close and personal uh, view of where those seizures are coming from. Because you have to remember in order to get an EEG, it has to be on top of the skin and the scalp and the tissue and the bone and the fluid, and then it uh, is reading the signal from the brain. So to, to get that intimacy of the electrodes on top of the brain, you really get much more granularity and fine tuning as to where this may be coming from. Because when we're talking about advancing to next steps of resection, you wanna make sure that you have as much high resolution data uh, and you're pinpointing it to as close as possible to the exact site of the origin of the seizures possible to make sure that you are uh, minimizing damage and maximizing uh, therapeutic care for the patient. So we do the phase two uh, and I'll show you, we'll go through some pictures and the hope is, is that a successful phase two will either lead to resection, various different types of resection uh, or laser ablation, which is a little bit less invasive. Uh, those are the, the ideal best case outcomes for a surgical candidacy because that is the, those are the, uh, the possibilities that, that yield the highest likelihood of success for control or curing of seizures. Depending on the location, the type, you can get upwards of 70, if not 90% or above uh, cure rate of epilepsy in resection cases. If the phase two is unrevealing or the consensus is that the phase two will be uh, not as beneficial for the patient, the other alternatives would be an R uh, a BNS, which is a vagal nerve stimulator. Uh, other considerations would be an RNS and a DBS, most often, the phase twos will, uh, the, the RNS will require a phase two, just to make sure that you know where your, your sites are gonna be. Um, and then DBS may or may not need a, a phase two as well. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about each of the possible options. So the phase, the phase two surgery, uh, depending on where the seizures are coming from uh, and how deep it is where you're looking to, to target, uh, they will suggest either grids and strips or stereotactic EEGs. So in a stereotactic EEG, you have to remember the brain looking like a walnut. There's all these grooves. If uh, it is appearing 
that it's coming from a deep site, excuse me, if it's coming from a deep site and it's may not, maybe not gonna be as uh, amenable to being seen perfectly with the grids and the strips, uh, they may target it with uh, stereotactic EEG, which I'll show you. It, it looks like just a, a big long needle. The grids and strips are really helpful if you're looking at the surface of the brain. And if it's near a site that's gonna be valuable, like language, like movement, then you wanna make sure that you're not uh, encroaching or crowding an area that's called eloquent cortex that may not be amenable to surgery. And you really wanna make sure that you're not missing anything uh, and that you're getting it uh, as precise as possible. So if the phase two finds the site and it's in a place that can be resected, uh, then, then they move forward with talking about what the next step is and what the best surgical option is. If there's more than one site, we'll talk about that shortly. So this is a, an, uh, an x-ray of what someone who has had a phase two uh, or is in the process of having a phase two will look like. So on the left here, you'll have grid mapping. So that's where the grids and strips are. You can see that there's two different squares. There's one big square in the center and one kind of to the right, meaning that there are multiple areas of cortex at the top of the surface of the brain that they want to cover to make sure that they're uh, understanding exactly where the seizures are coming from. And that's also really valuable because if you're concerned that it may be coming from a place that cannot be taken out, you can actually stimulate those areas with those electrodes uh, to test to see if they are in a site. And that's a little bit beyond the scope of this conversation, but those may be helpful if you are worried about an area that, that may not be resectable. And if you look to the right, you'll see the electrode placement of those EEG leads that are for deeper areas of possible seizure origin. Um, as you can see, they go into the brain tissue and really give you an up close and personal view of where the electrographic activity may be coming from. So if the person is amenable for resection, uh, this is typically what a resection looks like. Uh, it's usually about three centimeters of the anterior temporal pole. Uh, if it's amenable, it may go as far back as five to six centimeters. And as you can see on the undersurface, this part of the brain right here is the hippocampus, which is very heavily involved in memory and seizures, and the amygdala, which is involved in the limbic system. And these parts can also be targeted exclusively with uh, the 27 letter word amygdala hippocampectomy, where they can just take that part out or they can take out the whole temporal lobe here or the, uh, the temporal pole here or do a standard, uh, uh, standard uh, lobectomy, temporal lobectomy. Those are in, in the best case scenarios where uh, the neuropsychological evaluation deems that they're not going to take too big of an adverse hit from, from losing that much brain tissue. The other uh, treatment option, which is fairly new, I don't want to say it's very new, it's close, getting close to a decade old, but it's not necessarily as available, is laser interstitial thermal therapy, or LIT. So essentially what that is, is once they've gotten the phase two, they have an idea where it's coming from, they have a targeted site that they want to take out, they will simply go in with one very long needle probe. Uh, once they get to the, and it's all done under MRI guidance. Once they get to the targeted site, they will heat up the tip of the needle in a fashion that is so incredibly uh, fascinating that it only, uh, it only burns the area very adjacent to the tip so that it gives you absolute control of how much you uh, tissue you are uh, cauterizing. And it, uh, you can actually modify just how much of an area you want affected based on, on various settings that they have. So live in person, this is essentially what it looks like. So they're targeting an area in the mesial temporal structures here. They're going in with, an anterior, with a posterior approach. And as you can see, the needle goes all the way to the anterior tip. And this is the actual ablation process. You see that it's heating up. And three months post, you see nice scarring in the area that they have heated up. 
So, you know, a lot of patients prefer this because it's less invasive. Um, the literature shows that it's effective. It's maybe not as effective as this, the resections, but it's still a very effective um, modality. And I think is one that's gaining a lot of traction because it is less invasive. And I think in the next couple of years, we'll see quite a bit of development and progress towards heading more towards that. So the RNS, so the RNS is really a responsive nerve stimulation. So this is answering a question of what do you do if there is more than one site where this user may be coming from? And once it's been identified on the EEG and it has been confirmed that there is two sites, uh, often, you know, almost always, it will be a phase two to confirm the exact sites that they're coming from to make sure that there's no missed spots. Um, and once it's been confirmed that there is two spots, regardless of where they may be, uh, RNS is really kind of the uh, front runner candidate for treatment if they are very clear cut uh, origins. So that's one particular case in which it'd be an, an RNS may be used. Another one would be if you end up you know, doing a phase two and you find out that, hey, the seizure is coming from an area that is too close to the language center to be taken out without any effect on language or too close to the movement centers that would be significantly affected and disrupted by resecting it. That's when you start talking about RNS. So an RNS will actually look like this. So this illustration perfectly illustrates what it does. It has two, it only has the capability as of now for two different sites. And it has two different treatment options. It has the strip, which will sit uh, on the top of the, uh, the brain, much like the, the strips of the phase two, or it has the depth, just like the depth of phase two. So depending on where your, your area of irritability and where your target is, you will pick one or the other or both, as is, as is the case in here. And you will uh, use all of the data you've gathered up to this point to place these strips in these, uh, this depth uh, as close to or in or on the site responsible for the seizures. And what this does essentially is, and, and this is fantastic testament to technology, this um, uh, battery here, this is the, the stimulator here, is checked every so often. And what this does is this uses the battery to continually monitor. This actually is almost like a rolling continuous 24 hour EEG. And what it does is it's actually incredibly intelligent. It will start detecting the, the seizures. And as it detects the seizures more and more, it will actually evolve to detect it faster and better. And what it does when it detects a seizure is actually it sends an electric uh, a zap, essentially, for lack of a better term for simplified purposes. It sends a zap to disrupt the, the area of seizure and prevent it from progressing to a seizure. So it's actually, this is a, you know, a technology that's been really advocated for the last 10 years or so. And it's been uh, very remarkable, uh, both in its uh, complexity and its ability to control seizures for patients who previously didn't have an option for surgery because they had more than one site coming. Uh, they had more than one site where the seizures were coming from. And the next one is VNS. So if, we present the case and they don't think that they're a good candidate for surgery, there's more than one site, there's more than two sites, it's a primary generalized type seizure, meaning it's a genetic type seizure. Uh, what, it, what are the options there? Well, what, what can be offered to the patient? And just because it's not amenable to surgery doesn't mean that the role of the epileptologist or the neurosurgeon is done. In fact, uh, there's still plenty of other options here. And that's where VNS, vagal nerve stimulator, so a vagal nerve simulator has a little battery here that sits usually anywhere between kind of the clavicle and the armpit. And it has a wire that snakes up. It's all under the skin. So it's not visible. You have a scar from where they plant it, but they, it, it's under the skin. It leads up and it ropes up around and it goes to the vagus nerve, which is coming out of your brain. It's, in the spinal, it's one of the, uh, the cranial nerves. It, and it kind of, wraps around the vagus nerve and what it does, and it's uh, got many iterations of it. And it's, it's also advanced in its intelligence as well over the last 10 years. 
is it will fire at a set rate, a set interval, frequency, intensity, and it will have various other components of it that will detect subtle changes in your body to see if it needs to give you an additional burst of, of uh, charge. So it'll detect the abnormal variations in heart rate. Is this a heart rate that is appropriate or is this a heart rate that is coming out of nowhere that can be associated with seizures? It will detect all of these things and it will help try to modulate the seizure progression and propagation. And we've seen quite a significant improvement of the control of seizures with the addition of a BNS. So one of the newer uh, pieces of technology, and this has really been kind of approved through the SANTI trials, I believe a little bit more than six or so years ago, maybe seven or so. Uh, it's a deep brain stimulator. So the deep brain stimulator is currently used in um, patients who have Parkinson's disease, it, it targets the thalamus. Um, what it does in this uh, particular disease process with epilepsy is it, it targets another different center in the thalamus. But what it works to do is it, it works to regulate and change the, the networking of the seizure. Because uh, even though we've done so much and we've gotten so far in advance in our understanding of treatment of epilepsy, we still don't understand a lot about it, but the thalamus does appear to have some sort of role in modulating and managing seizures. What this does is it, it goes in and it stimulates that thalamus in a rate, interval, and frequency set by us to help better control seizure frequency. So this is, this is kind of what it looks like. So that you have, again, you have the, um, the battery down here, the stimulator down here, there's a a lead that goes all the way up around the neck up to the top and it implants all the way deep into the thalamus. So those are kind of the developments that we've had. The question is really what is next on the horizon? So we talked about the DBS, we talked about the uh, RNS with the cortical stimulation. We talked about the VNS. Uh, the RNS is over here as well. Um, the transcranial magnetic stimulator is actually a really cool and really interesting uh, idea. It's something that's still kind of in the works. Uh, you know, I know USC is one of the centers being utilized for the um, trials that are looking at trans transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, but what it does, it essentially provides a magnetic current at a you know, certain amount of times a day to see if this current adjustment on the electrical activity can potentially modulate and reduce uh, seizures, which is incredibly cool, very cool. Um, and it's not a medication, so patients are really excited about that. And it's not something that you plant in your body, so patients are really excited about that. Um, so there's still more to come with that. And as far as drugs, I mean, drugs are being worked on in various different stages of clinical trials as we speak. Uh, I don't anticipate there's going to be a, a slowdown of that either. It's going to continue to kind of grow at this really rapid rate that it has for, I think, years to come. And I think, you know, in the long run, this RNS has been so interesting, so exciting that the possibility that there will be more than one or even more than two uh, sites that it can target, I think that is also probably going to come uh, down the road as well. 